Let us pray. Holy Spirit, come to us today. Fill us with your love and your grace. Help us once more to understand the power of Pentecost as we open ourselves to you. May we truly feel your love and your grace. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Today is a very special day in the life of the church. In fact, if you had to look at all the various Sundays and celebrations that we go through, this day would be one of the most important days that we celebrate. Easter, of course, is important, and certainly the birth of Christ. But then in my mind, I would have to put the Sunday of Pentecost as the next one. Because it was on the day of Pentecost that the church experienced the outpouring of God's Spirit in a way that made changes in the hearts and lives of people and that have brought us to this place today. It was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit some 2,000 years ago that started the process that allows us to sit in this sanctuary and worship God this morning. That is a tremendous change agent. That is a tremendous power. And to understand the promise of God to come and to be our comforter and abide with us is something that we as United Methodists wholeheartedly affirm and believe in. We believe that God's Spirit is present and that God's Spirit makes a difference in our lives. Just 50 days ago, we were getting ready to celebrate the resurrection. The disciples had all scattered. They had all denied Christ. They had left. There was darkness over the earth. The power of the empire seemed to have won. This band of rebels from the countryside had been dispelled and given their proper treatment, and they wouldn't be causing any more problems. But on that Resurrection Sunday, there was a seed of hope that was glimpsed. Hope that perhaps the stories that Jesus told were true, and that truly he was alive and that he would make a difference because he would be present with us. And as those seeds of hope grew during the next 40 days, we then came to the Ascension Day, Ascension Sunday. And Jesus said, 10 days ago, I must go away. And if I go away, I'll send another one to you, the Comforter. And he'll come and abide with you and give you the power to be the kind of Christian that you need to be. And so it is today that we celebrate Pentecost Sunday. And as Kim has read during children's time, the story in Acts is so familiar. For we see the Spirit of God falling upon the disciples as they were gathered in the upper room in one accord, and suddenly their world changed. Have you ever wanted to change in your life? Have you ever wanted to say, I'm tired of the routine, I'm tired of the drudgery, I'm tired of playing the same old games and living with the same old excuses, I'm tired of doing the same old thing and not getting anywhere? Have you ever truly wanted to change? Sometimes we do that by thinking, well, we'll just move somewhere. Well, we take our problems with us, don't we? You can move clear across the world and your problems will still be with you until we change. Jesus recognized that. And the promise he made for us was a promise that we could change and be different people. And so on that day of Pentecost, the power of the Holy Spirit fell upon those people gathered together as they were worshiping, and suddenly those timid people, those people who had hidden in fear, those people who had left wondering if Jesus was ever going to live again. Those people were out on the street corner proclaiming the word of God, performing miracles, doing things that they never thought they could do before, like teaching at VBS. Or serving on a church committee. Or helping wherever they see a need. In fact, it says that it was such a marvelous sight that people were astonished. That people spoke in different languages. And I know the church has gone through centuries of discussion as to whether that was a prayer language and so on and so forth. But let's be honest, we all speak different languages, don't we? Have you, do you have a teenager at home? 
they, they speak a different language. And sometimes we struggle with trying to talk their language, to learn what they're saying, to try to understand them. And the church, the church can be so set in our ways to where we say, come to us and understand it our way and speak our language and hear it the way we say it. And if you can't, sorry. But the, the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon the church and gives us the ability to do that which otherwise we could not do. We speak the language that people can hear. And so we speak a language that gives them acceptance, gives them hope, even though they are different and even though they may not even understand themselves. In fact, the miracles were so wonderful and so great that people got confused and concerned and said, these people are drunk. These disciples, they've just been hitting the wine. And I love the excuse that was given. No, they're not drunk. It's just 9 o'clock. Follow that through. No, they're not drunk. It's too early for them to be drunk. When was the last time we did something exciting for God? When was the last time we felt the Holy Spirit come in our hearts and our lives and make a difference? When was the last time we felt like God has really spoken to us and changed us as human beings? That's why the day of Pentecost is so important. Because it speaks to us of how God is at work in our hearts and our lives. And the change agent that we need in the church is not the preacher. Preachers come and go. Programs come and go. Sunday school teachers stay forever, but they're, they're still not going to change everything. <laughs> What do we need? We need the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to change us. Now, what happened on that day? Well, they all came together in one accord, Scripture records, and they confessed, number one, that Jesus Christ was Lord. Jesus Christ as Lord was the common thing that brought them together, the common confession that they shared. And because of that, God could use them. Now remember 2,000 years ago that they were under Roman domination. And the Roman emperor thought himself to be divine. He was Lord. He was God. And so for you to say that Jesus is Lord over saying that the emperor was Lord was to put you in peril. And in fact... Many early Christians did lose their lives. They paid the martyr's price because they were willing to say, Jesus is Lord. It's not about us. It's not about what we want. It's not about the church. It's not about the building. It's not about our culture. It's not about being American. It's about what God wants for our world and our lives. Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, we've changed over the years. Our emperors are no longer claiming divinity, except maybe for a few in recent history. But we've changed, and we've, got, we've come to the place now where we have struggled with other allegiances. It's not only as Jesus is Lord, but what pagan worship do we follow? You say, well, I'm not a pagan worshiper. Are you sure? Oh, you may not have that ritual or routine, but when you're more concerned about what Kim Kardashian is doing than what you are with what God is doing, something is wrong. When you're more concerned and excited about what's happening on reality TV and who's going to get voted in and voted off, something is wrong. Jesus is Lord. The apostles were not afraid to make that proclamation that Jesus is Lord. And we in the church are not either. For Jesus is Lord of our lives. And because of that, we pledge our allegiance and we pledge our lives because it changes us. We're no longer bound by all the conventions of the world because we don't get our input and our satisfaction and our direction from that, we get it from God. And because of that, 
We can live with power and purpose in our lives. We can live with a sense of meaning. Now, if you go to the doctor tomorrow, I can guarantee you, 99% of you, he'll tell you at least two things. You need to go on a diet, and you need to exercise more. Doctors could take a prescription pad and write that out a hundred times and just pass it out. I think they do sometimes. That's just standard things that we need to do. If you want to know where your heart is, all you have to do is look in your prayer journal. Now, you may think, I, I don't have a prayer journal. Oh, yes, you do. You just didn't know it. You have a prayer journal that will tell you exactly where your heart is. It's called your checkbook. Because where your heart is is where your money is. And if your money is absorbed in self, if your money is absorbed in your own security, if your money is absorbed in your own possessions, if your money is absorbed in taking care of me and mine, and if you're not thinking anything of the rest of the world, if you're not thinking anything of creation, if you're not thinking anything beyond yourself, then your heart is not with God. The wonderful thing is, God loves us. And God forgives us. And when we come to that reality of where we need to be, God will work with us to be devoted to his cause and to be what he would want us to be. So there is that common confession that Jesus is Lord. And it changed the church. It brought us to where we are today. There is also a variety of expressions. That long list of what people can do and how they can minister. It's a wonderful list of all the ways in which God can minister, but that in itself doesn't contain all of the ways in which God can use your gifts. For God has blessed us with so many ways in which we can be in ministry. Now, when I was growing up, to be in Christian service meant that you either were a minister or a missionary. But fortunately, that attitude has changed. And now you can be an agricultural agent on a mission field. You can be a nutritionist on a mission field. In other words, what you do is take whatever you are doing, what God has called you to do, and instead of being a business person who happens to be a Christian, be a Christian business person. Instead of being a housewife who happens to be a Christian, be a Christian housewife. Instead of being a student who happens to be a Christian, be a Christian student and how that changes us for suddenly we realize that our values have all been changed it's not something that we play with any longer it's not just putting God on Sunday morning if we have time and if it's convenient but we realize that God is with us and speaking to us every day of our lives and challenging us to be what we can be to turn our hearts and our lives over to him in a wonderful way. I've often said that I was glad, God, that Christians did not create the world. Because if Christians had created the world, it would all be in black and white. I mean, that's just the way we think. It's either good or bad. We either like it or we don't like it. But have you looked at creation lately? There's a whole rainbow of colors out there that I just blows my mind to imagine how God created all of this for us and has given us the wonderful blessing to live in a world filled with diversity and we want to limit it. We want to say it doesn't work, it can't change. We've got to be a black and white person. Well, the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to do some things in color, to enjoy life, to enjoy God's presence, and to have the power of God in our heart and our life that guides us and leads us in wonderful ways. And then the power of God helps us to have a unified witness. While we have differences of expression, sometimes we get in competition with each other. And you know the Methodist women, you know, they're stronger than the Methodist men, who's stronger than the Sunday school class and who's stronger than this and pretty soon the church can be all divided into factions 
we fail to understand that God has called us to be together, to work together as brothers and sisters in Christ. And my role as minister of this church is no greater than your role because we are together in our pilgrimage. Hopefully I can be of help to you as you can be of help to me as we encourage one another and pray for one another and strengthen one another in our faith. But so many times we come to the place where we think, well, we'll let someone else do it. We'll hire it done. It's easier to give $10 than to go to the food kitchen and actually serve the food sometimes. Well, maybe we need to do both. Maybe we need to not only give and give generously, but we also need to serve. And by doing so, we allow ourselves to be open to God's Spirit in a fresh and wonderful way. We always want to think that someone else will do it. But ultimately, it comes back to us. Have any of you heard that old, uh, the phrases about how many so-and-sos or how many, how many church people it takes to change a light bulb? Have you heard that? You know what I'm talking about? How many church people does it take to change a light bulb? Did you realize it takes 16 Baptists to change a light bulb? One to change it and three committees to plan the celebration and the potluck dinner. You can laugh. God won't, won't <laughs> get mad at you. How many Presbyterians does it take to change a light bulb? None. It's predestined to go out whenever it chooses. <laughs> so you don't need to change it. How many Catholics does it take to change a light bulb? None. They have candles only. How many Episcopalians? Three. One to change it, one to mix the drinks, and one to talk about how good the old one was. <laughs> how many Methodists? How many Methodists does it take to change a light bulb? Now, I'm not going to read you what it said. I'm going to tell you what I feel and believe. How many Methodists does it take to change a light bulb? Only one. The first one who sees that it needs to be changed because it is the power of the Holy Spirit that gives us the power to do and to be what God has called us to do and to be. It is that power, that promise, that is given to each and every one of us today. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.